You're listening to IRN, the Inception Radio Network, Chicago, Illinois. Extraordinary Phenomenon Investigations Council presents Epic Voyages. Come join us as we enter and experience the great mysteries of the world with tonight's host, Laurel Blythe Tagg. Welcome back, everybody, to Epic Voyages Radio. I'm your host tonight, Laurel Blythe Tag, and you're listening to Inception Radio Network, uh, where you could join us in the chat room if you like, or there's several different ways to listen to us live stream there if you'll check us out. Uh, our guest tonight, who I'll introduce in just a minute, is Patty Fibet. I was just corrected on pronouncing her last name. It's a toughie. Patty Fivett, um, Ph.D. She's an author, an ordained minister, a modern mystic, and we're going to have to find out what she means by that, facilitator, speaker, artist, and also a member of Spiritual Directors International. Um, before we start the interview tonight, what I'd like to do is uh, mention just a few little things First of all, you know you're listening to Inception Radio Network. Our show is rebroadcast on Friday nights at 8 o'clock uh, Eastern on Dark Matter Radio Network. And we have archived interviews here uh, going all the way back to June 2011 at Inception Radio Network. Just go to Shows Archive and pick out Epic Voyages Radio and check it out. Uh, our website, Epic Voyagers, E P I C V O Y A G E R S dot com, is still under renovation, but we do have links on the home page to um, uh, YouTube. We have a channel with hundreds of hours of videos, presentations, podcasts, all kinds of things. You have links to Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I also want to mention tonight that we're offering right now a promotion on Instagram. Every person that follows us and tags three friends will be entered into a lottery to win one free autographed copy of Ken Cherry's new book, Mark Slade Investigates the Stephenville UFO, uh, which is also available on Amazon.com. You should check that out. It's a book that's based on fact, Ken was the Texas State MUFON director at that point in time, 2008, and he knows all the secrets, he knows where all the skeletons are buried, and you should really check out his book. Um, so, with that, let me uh, tell you what our topic is tonight. Patty has written, I think this is her second book, and I believe you're in the middle of writing your third and maybe your fourth one. Yes. This this one tonight we're talking about uh, is very interesting to me. I'm very interested in mysticism, have been for many, many, many years. Uh, the title is The Making of a Mystic, 
writing as a form of spiritual emergence. And as a way to introduce it, I want to uh, read something from her website here. Have you ever felt fragmented or felt like something was missing from your life? Are you seeking personal freedom, wholeness, or a deeper form of spirituality? Uncover that beautiful, wonderful soul that you already are. Joy is discovered from the inside out. It's your attitude about your experiences that most profoundly influence your life. Surrender to the divine spirit connecting all of us in nature as living entities. Uh, those of you out there listening tonight who are interested in metaphysics, you are in for a wonderful show. And at that, I'm going to introduce Patty. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm so glad to be here. This is exciting. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here, too. Um, why don't you tell everybody about your first book a little bit? I guess the first book was a little bit more uh, autobiographical. The first book is actually a memoir, yes, it's When Life Cried Out, uh, secondary title, One Woman's Spiritual Quest to Be Fully Alive. And in that book, I start when I was terribly, terribly lost in life. I was in a marriage that was not working. To tell you the truth, I didn't care whether I was on this planet or uh, just floated off uh, into the other world uh, through my own hand. I was just absolutely miserable. And the book starts at that point, and it explains how I surrendered in a thunderstorm one night. And uh, nothing in my life had any meaning to me anymore. The marriage was just a legal piece of paper that, that we had to navigate through to, to end. Uh, it wasn't marriage in any kind of true loving sense at all. In fact, I was afraid of my husband in some ways. And uh, so I had that going on. And uh, the church that I had gone to for years uh, it, it didn't mean anything to me anymore. And uh, friendships meant nothing. The hobbies I had, I was crashing. Everything that I had held so dear just wasn't, uh, it wasn't fulfilling me. We lived in a rather large house. It was filled with antiques. And while in my 20s and 30s, I was accumulating these antiques and loved them, uh, it, they were just things at that point in time. But I didn't know where I needed to go. I just knew that I didn't know how to get there. And the thunder and lightning were just popping like crazy about four days before Thanksgiving in, um, I guess it was 2001. And uh, so I um, ended up on my knees in a thunderstorm uh, right the, the flowers outside the door were being pelted into into the mud, and that's how I felt. And I said a one-sentence prayer that changed my life. Uh, I said, with every cell in my body, I meant it. I said, whatever is standing in the way of my spiritual path, may it fall from me. And the listeners, if anybody ever decides to do that, please ask uh, the divine to uh, do it with light and love at ease because it was not easy at all. <laughs> Everything I knew began to fall from me. So that's how that book get, got started. And um, I ended up on a journey throughout the world. It wasn't going to places that I thought would be a spiritual quest, I ended up going to places that I was led to go through dreams, through intuition, through reading magazines or seeing something printed over and over and over. You know, I literally was led because I am not particularly the kind of person that's adventurous enough to get on an airplane by myself and, and go to the to the pyramids of Egypt or go to Auschwitz by myself or anything like that. And I really wasn't back then because I was having panic attacks, maybe six at a, an hour at times. Wow, wow. Yeah, so that's where I was by the end of the book, uh, when life cried out, by the end of the book, I explain how I finally got to the place 
by visiting all these places, I picked up a little piece of myself at each place I went or reincorporated a higher piece of myself everywhere I went. But by the end of the book, I'm looking up at the stars and I realized that love is not out there in the cosmos. It's not in the face of of a lover, it's it's not in our friendships, it's not in our church or organizations, it's not in our job, it's not in our children's faces, although some of those things can be love. True love was an inside job. And at that point, I looked up at the stars and felt totally, totally connected. And that's what the book is about. It's about the journey from A to, to Z uh, for me. So you were... I mean, you were really completely, totally divorced from who you really are and any any was, awareness of why you were here or why you should want to be here. Laurel, I was so di- completely divorced from who I was created to be that I didn't even know who I was created to be. I'd look in the mirror instead of seeing love in my own eyes, a divine spark, I would see my role as a as a mother or my role as a daughter or my role as a southern uh, society person or my role as as a wife and I knew what to wear to the club meetings but I didn't know what I liked to wear. You know, I was terribly lost. In fact, at one point, I knew my husband had a gun under the bottom of his his pickup truck's front seat. And about three o'clock one night, I went outside to see if it was still there because he tended to move it around see if it was still there i had i had my plan i was i was out of here man i I was gonna get out of here and so i wanted to make sure it was still there and i got out and the moon was shining it was not full moon but it was a bright enough moon and it was a clear starry sky and i got the gun and i looked and i knew how to cock it but i didn't do any of that i knew how to put the the clip with the bullets in it but I, i didn't do any of that i looked down the barrel and I thought at that time where's the light it was so dark down that barrel even in the moonlight and then I thought where is my light I didn't know where my light was where is my light and it wasn't two weeks later that I had an experience I felt like there was something wrong on the back of my, on my back. It's the center back, uh, directly opposite the heart, just on the back. Mm-hmm. And I went to three dermatologists. I feel like there's something wrong Two der- within a week. Two dermatologists said, oh, there's nothing wrong. And the third dermatologist said, oh, my God. Goodness, I think we need to do a biopsy with this. Maybe we just need to take it off. Fine, I didn't care to take it off. Well, he called me after the biopsy came back. In fact, he called me as he was traveling. He called me on his cell phone, and which is unusual for a physician to do. And he said, it's melanoma. Mm. And for a little bit, Laurel, I thought, I don't need the gun. All I need to do is let the thing grow. Oh, God, that's just chilling. It is. It's Thinking about it now, I, I get a stomachache because I feel like I punched myself in my own stomach. But uh, I let it go. That was the most beautiful stage one melanoma in this world. It oh. was. And I tell you why. Because at that point, I realized Oh, my word, it wasn't death I wanted. It was life. I wanted life. I wanted real life. I wanted to laugh. I wanted joy. I wanted to be connected to God again and not just through the, through the, um, uh, the rigors of, of church life. I wanted real connection. I wanted to know who I was when I looked in the mirror. I wanted to know what I was supposed to be on this earth for. I wanted to live. I mean, really, really, really live. I wanted to be in my own flow. So the mel- it took six operations, but they got the thing. And uh, I bless that experience now because without it, I would probably have made a terrible, terrible, terrible mistake because I was so lost that I didn't know what I really wanted until that happened. That's, that's really chilling. And I, I, I have to say, as, as painful as it is to hear you tell that story, it takes a lot of courage, I think, to speak up and, and 
tell that story about yourself. I know that many more people than care to admit it have been at, at a point like that where it just the only way that you feel like you can stop all the nonsense and the pain and, and the sadness is just end it all. Just end it all. A lot more people are there than that folks, I think, would like to admit. And it takes a lot of courage for you to say that. Thank you. I have never felt like I was a courageous person, but but I have been told that, that I was. I've well, always the fact felt that like I was the world's going. scary cat. I did keep going because yeah. I realized what it was I wanted, and my faith has always been strong, although it had gotten shaken up at that point because, hey, I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. I mean, I was saying my prayers at night. I was blessing my food. I was going to church on Sunday. Why is life not working? I'm doing what I'm supposed to what what what's going on here you know so uh i had that kind of thing that that was um uh really interesting uh, looking back at it but i'll tell you and, and i will mention this to the listeners because at this point because i think it's really really important i had had my experiences of, of going to different countries and and i had my growth but it never really integrated as fully as it could have until I wrote this memoir, this first memoir, When Life Cried Out. It never did. I have since read that writing uh, your story, writing your life's history, literally moves trauma from the base of the brain, the fight or flight mechanism where post-traumatic stress is stored in the brain. I'm not a scientist, so I can't tell you what that's called. But in the back of the brain, at the, the top of the um, top of the backbone, it's Somewhere stored around back the amygdala, there. I think it is. Yeah, yeah, it's stored right there. And you can, as long as you've got post-traumatic stress that is stored right back there, you can talk about it from now to kingdom come with a, a, with a trained professional until you write your story down, until you write your trauma. It does not move from that area of the brain to the front area of the brain where you can analyze it and talk about it. And process it. And process it. Interesting. And that's what happened with When Life Cried Out. It was not an easy job. I rewrote it five times. I wanted to soft soap it. I wanted it first. I wanted to make it a sweet little story about love. <laughs> but that just wasn't doing me any good. And at one point, I even thought, uh, after about two years of, of writing this book on and off and, and trying to get where I needed to go with it, I sort of gave up. But I went to a writers conference in Asheville and I was sitting there that first day and maybe 500 people there in that auditorium or at least three and the first day the first speaker said how many people are writing memoir well half of the people raised their hand and this this uh conference was was um organized by a self-publishing company and so half of us raised our hand and then unbelievably she said this first speaker said if you're writing a memoir it'll never be successful until everybody knows who you are well that's not the reason a lot of people need to rewriting memoirs but but the whole room just sort of deflated you know <laughs> so yeah as, as a marketing technique that was that was dumb <laughs> mm -hmm. or or maybe could have been done better that's a better way of saying it yeah but, a little blunt so, yeah terribly so that night I felt like I'd been punched in the stomach I really did because I, I was gonna stop I was gonna go home the next morning forget the conference I'm going home and I needed something to eat because the front of my stomach was beginning to digest the back of my stomach, and it was not it was not comfortable. Ooh. I went to three vending machines on three different floors, and none of them were working. None oh. of them were working. I went to the fourth vending machine right there by the front desk, and there was a man there, and he said, it's not working, but the manager has gone to get the key so she can open it up and we can just pay her and get what we want. I said, oh, wonderful. I'm sitting here holding my hands across my shoulder plexus. And this, this gentleman was there, and he was much younger than I was. And just to make conversation, he had on a badge, and I did too. Make conversation, he said, so what are you writing? I said, the forever memoir, but at this point, I think I'm going to give up. And then 
to be polite back, I said, and what do you do? He said, I am a writing coach. I help people finish their forever memoirs. <laughs> I said, do what? Right there he by said, the vending machine. <laughs> right there by the vending machine. He said, I'm a memoir editor. Oh, be and darn. Because I had been around the block with several different men in my life. I looked at him and said, prove it. <laughs> uh, uh, and and he gave me his card and bless Pete, there it was. And so by the grace of God, he pulled this this first book out of me. It's well written, I'll say. I, I, I learned how to write through working with him. But I tell that story because there was a greater plan in me writing that first book, uh, a much greater plan. And I had the sense to tune into this greater plan because I mean what are the chances that four vending machines on four floors would not work and a memoir editor would be standing right there (laughs) you You just think he was a real human being he probably wasn't (laughs) it didn't matter to me but it was like like uh, um a whisper of God that was sort of shouting saying you're not gonna stop Right, right. You're going to finish. <laughs> Thank goodness for those kinds of whispers, too. Yes, yes, definitely. Well, um, there's two questions here, and I'm not sure which one I should ask you in, in order. So I'm going to go ahead with my outline and pick this first one. Okay. It, throughout your book, you talk about, you use different terms, but you talk about what I would call and what you call a divine spark that's inside of everyone. I would like for you to explain what you mean by this divine spark that lives inside of a person and why is it important and how does someone reach that? Okay, that's a lot of a lot of questions, but they're all one subject and I'm glad you chose that one next. This is fun. Uh, a lot of people on earth think they're they're having a life and searching for the spiritual. They think they're a human being searching for the spiritual in their life. And actually, every person on this planet, and probably more than that with the trees, the flowers, and whatever, but right now let's just talk about people. Every person on this planet is a spiritual being having a life experience. And that's, that's a whole different 180-degree turnaround. So, uh, but we don't know it. We're not taught it in school. We're not taught it in church. I know I wasn't. I didn't learn it at Mother's Knee. She didn't know it. How would she teach it? She didn't know it. So I had to figure this out for myself. And it was little by little. It was, uh, it wasn't some sort of grand revelation. I'm an avid reader. I began to read about this. I began to uh, go to different places in the world and have these experiences. But the most profound experience of recognizing that there was something out there I was connected with that really loved me and cared for me and supported me and was part of me. That first realization came, uh, it began at a Carolyn Mace seminar. My intuition, when I in my early 50s, my intuition, I just flooded back it had been put away as a child as a very intuitive child I was but it had been put away because of lack of validation and it just flooded back and I didn't know what was happening and so I began to explore and this was toward the end of the marriage and I felt like I needed to go to a Carolyn Mace uh, seminar. She was talking about sacred contracts at that time. I did not have a clue what a sacred contract was, but the feeling wouldn't wouldn't leave. And at that point, I was having panic attacks fairly regularly, but I didn't think I could get there. I never had problems in a car. And so I knew I could drive there, but sitting in the auditorium full of people, I didn't know about that. So I conned a massage therapist friend of mine, a much younger man, uh, if he would go. And he was going anyway, and he was taking one of his clients, and he said, well, just meet us there, and you can sit with us. Okay, now I've got maybe an anchor in case something happens. And I thought, okay, maybe I can do this. And I explained this in the book. Uh, in more detail, making of a mystic, but but uh, I got there. I had trouble finding them. I had trouble getting my seat. I had trouble giving the lady my name. It was completely all of it was overwhelming to me. But I sat there in the uh, um, in Carolyn Macy's talk, trying to understand. But I was so 
not present with my own self that I couldn't follow her. And it wasn't her, it was me. And I guess it was shortly before the first break, I began having one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My eyes, my vision began to close down. My my legs from the knees down became numb. I couldn't, didn't know where my feet were. My hands were tingling. Uh, my breathing was, was labored. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. My ears were shutting down. It's just a horrible, horrible panic attack. I had to get out of there. That three-story um, ceiling felt like it was closing down on me. And so I got up and ran outside, and I was standing on the bridge bridge uh, just to the left of the front door of the building and there was a little little bridge with a, a rock wall and I was standing there and there was a, a train track of a couple of stories below and I thought if I could just get one of those rocks that was on the train track and hold that rock I would be all right I was totally out of my senses wow. and um, so I was leaning over and leaning over and leaning over and and the massage therapist friend came over and he realized what was happening he got me back into the room I sat on the sofa for a while and they had had a break a mid-morning break and so I went in and here's where uh, God's special um special attention came sitting there uh, trying to breathe again trying to get the panic to subside and this lady sitting to my right I had no idea who she was I had never met her I hadn't even looked at her face when I sat down but she was sitting next to me right she said you're having a panic attack aren't you I said yes as best I could she said turn your back to me and she took um, a pencil eraser and went up and down my backbone and across my backbone, hitting acupressure points and told me to hold my breath and then told me to breathe and regularly and, and uh, different different ways of breathing and then told me to breathe deeply and breathe fast or something like that. I don't really remember. And th- it went away. Wow. I mean, snap your fingers and this thing went away. And I just turned around and said, who are you and what do you do? And she said, you're having an allergic reaction to the perfume of the woman in front of you. That's what's causing your panic attacks. You're probably allergic to a lot of things and chemicals on this, this, you know, in, in your environment. And she handed me her card and she said, I'm an allergy intuitive and I use energetic methods to help people overcome this. She was getting her doctorate at that time. At this point, she's, uh, I call her Maria in the book, at this point she's gotten several doctorates and is a Chinese energy medicine doctor and acupuncturist and everything else and a psychologist. So she was a good find for me, but I didn't go looking for her. <laughs> it just came to me. Wow. So she, I had been going to her house. It was from my, where I was living in Georgia. It was an hour and a half to her house. And so I had been going during the, the day. I'd put on my exercise clothes and tell my husband I was going to the gym. And he bid it. He, you know, he believed me. And so I would show up in my exercise clothes in her house and get an allergen treatment. It was not supported by, by my first husband. And uh, But I felt like it was what I needed to do because she was giving me relief when nobody else had. And I began to get better. And one day she said, uh, I'm having a course at my house and I want you to come. What kind of course? I don't need to go to a course. What kind of course? She said, oh, it's, it's, it's about um, connecting to the divine. Well, I had about tried all I could about this connecting to the divine business through church, and it just wasn't seemed to helping me at all. But she brought me with a couple of free allergy treatments. All right, now you're talking money, and you've got my attention at that point anyway. So I went, and Laurel, when I got there, it was a weekend seminar, and when I got there, there were 11 of the most intuitive ladies I had ever met in the world right there, and they were talking about it like it was the most natural thing, and like it was, uh, intuition was the language of the soul, which I now believe, which then scared me. So that's why I was, but the interesting thing about it was that I could do the exercises, I asked uh, Dr. Maria later why she insisted. She said, because I realized your intuition was put away as a child and and um, it was coming back and, and you needed some help. Well, she was right. And this is where my life changed. This is where I realized there was something out there that, call it God, call it spirit, call it creator, call it whatever you want to, um, 
something out there that loved me and that was part of me and needed me and I needed it, that there was a connection. The last exercise of the day, we were told to go into a quiet area of Dr. Maria's house and go into an altered state. And I did this, Laurel, as best I could. I felt like I was imitating a Sufi mystic sitting in the corner of the room with my legs crossed and my hands in my lap who knew what she was doing, but I didn't think I knew what I was doing at all. But I thought, well, uh, I'll give it a try. I was sort of coerced by the teacher to go back in there and give it a try. I didn't really try, want to try at all because I didn't want failure. And so there I was, and I had my pen and my paper in hand because our directions were to go into a quiet corner, write at the top of your paper something that has bothered you all of your life, some question that has bothered you all of your life, and then go into the altered state by breathing. This is how we were taught, by breathing and a very slow, watch your breath go in, watch your breath go out, you know, and try to focus on that and go into an altered state. And then see if you get a vision or maybe a couple of words will come or this type of thing. I thought, uh huh, sure. So, uh, anyway, so there I was. And my question I wrote at the top, I thought, well, I'll just go for broke. Here it is. Why do I never feel good enough? That was my question that had bothered me all my life. And here I was, 52 years old, and I was asking my question for the first time. And I went into altruist. I still had the pen in my hand from writing the question. I didn't think to lay it down, thank heavens. Because my hand started writing at the top of the page, and then it started writing at the bottom of the page, and then it wrote in the middle of the page, and then it wrote at the top, and then it wrote some more in the middle, and it began to fill in. Now, it was a legal tablet, and the writing was big, but it was my writing. It was large, but it was my writing. But I didn't know what was being written. I just knew how it felt. Because I walk through the world in a feeling state, and I have done this since birth, I think, but it's heightened now. But I felt like it was divine. I felt like it was, it had a higher vibration. I felt like this is something really, really important that's happening. And I hadn't read it. But the feeling that something really important had happened was so strong tears were forming and I didn't go back to the group well the teacher came to look for me her name was Tina and Tina came in and said Patty it's okay if nothing happened it's okay you tried I'm real proud of you for trying and I said Tina and by this time I was the tears were rolling I said something did happen something got written she said well what got written I don't know and she said well read it and so I read the answer to my question and uh That was the first time I knew what it was, and it was an answer, and it was a holy answer, and it was a special answer. It was like having, like I was a child, and something out there had given me a divine hug and said, here, honey, it's okay. You have not been born without, and that's basically uh, what I felt, and by the time I finished reading it, Tina was crying, and I was just sobbing, (laughs) and I went to the group, and um. Uh, several had gotten answers, and one person had had a, little, a drawing, and it meant something wonderful to them. And then Tina said, I want Patty to read hers. By the time I finished, six people were crying, and and they wanted copies of it out of, out of the wow. 12 people that were there. And so that's what changed my life. At that point... Uh, I I prefer to use the word God or spirit, so that's what I'm going to use. At that point, God didn't become something out there somewhere that I had to be good enough in order to get uh, to please. Mm -hmm. It switched. That was what I had learned in church. It switched from that to a presence that co-created with me and worked with me. And I was a novice, of course, but I thought, wow. Then about two weeks later, I thought, I wonder if it'll happen again. And I was in the basement office, very quiet, and I wrote at the top of my paper, and it happened again. And as it kept happening, I thought, well, I wonder if I can do it on the computer and just type my question and type the answer. 
And so it happened again, uh, and I could do it typing, but that only worked for me if I covered up the computer screen. I can type without uh, looking at what I'm doing, so I would do it with my eyes closed, and the computer screen was covered up so I wouldn't peek because that would stop the process. I have an internal editor that wants to change things around as I type. Right. So that, that took the editor out of it. But these things uh, began to happen. They changed over time as my own, you know, we're all vibrational beings. And uh, as uh, everything around you has a vibrational essence to it, and and there's lower vibrational things, there's there's higher vibrational things, and I mention that only because we as human beings can raise our vibrations. If we eat food that is full of pesticides and and um, this type thing, our food is not going to have a higher vibration. Uh, if we eat food that is grown maybe organically or correctly or or grown with without the pesticides and is more natural then it has a high vibration even if you're talking about two apples uh and so we all have higher vibrations and through these questions and answers i realized that my own sense of self or body if you want to call it was was I, I was working with a higher vibration my vibrational level was increasing and as that increased I became a lot more friendly to myself and that moved into accepting myself which moved into to uh, accepting my gifts and 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 uh, knowing who I was from the inside out. So to answer your question, it was a process of knowing that there's a divine spark within. But it was an ongoing process. But that first time with that first automatic writing, I knew that there was a possibility that there's a greater connection to God that I ever realized, and now I know that that uh, the spirit of God or God is, expresses God's self in all in all things. Uh, the butterfly is an expression of, of spirit. The tree is an expression of spirit. But it was all a journey for me. It was all a long, wonderful journey. It wasn't instantaneous, and I kept opening to it because it was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me. And it wasn't ordinary conversation. <laughs> <laughs> either right right um you use the term throughout your book um being receptive uh being open and i used to say um what you have to do is just get out of your own way uh that's the way i always look at it there's mm -hmm. there's something about the logical mind that it wants to be in charge of everything and if it's if it's not something that it came up with first then it it doesn't want to hear anything about it so um, we're going to talk a little bit later about about intuition and what a a amazing, awesome faculty it is, and how it's so vastly underrated. I have some quotes from uh, from Einstein. One of them you use in your book, and I found a couple of others that blew me away today that I want to read a little bit later. I think one of my favorite parts of of this book, uh, the making of a mystic, is a chapter where you talk about. Uh, the day that you went to uh, Rue Le Chateau, uh, oh, yes. and went to this chapel, and the, and I would like if you if you could, and you don't have to go into enormous detail, but please talk about that, and especially the ending of it when you opened your eyes. But talk okay. about how you got there and how it was not really turning you on. And well, I went to Rennes Le Chateau. I felt like I needed to go, and it was it was in France. It was I was uh, visiting Europe frequently back then. I, 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 spent some time in Belgium on and off and uh, so France wasn't that far from Belgium but I felt like I wanted to go to Rennes Le Chateau I had I had seen it noticed in a book noted in a book and I thought well that may be a neat place to go and it wasn't it was more than that though I thought there was something inside me that felt like I needed to do that and so when I got there I had a traveling companion, and immediately uh, he went one way, and I went the other way, and and he was more interested in the library, and I don't know what I was interested in, but I went through, and the chapel was doing nothing for me, and the, the place where some of the monks uh, monks and, and uh, priests and things lived was doing nothing for me, and I thought, well, there was a tower on the corner of the property that overlooked a valley, and it was quite 
pretty. And I thought, thought, well, maybe that tower was called the Mary Magdalene Tower. And I thought, well, maybe the tower. And, and so I, I joined a um, a group that was going in. They all had on name tags. I didn't. So I joined a group because they had somebody that was going to tell them about it. But unfortunately, they were telling about it in, in French. And I don't speak French. And I thought, this is not where I need to be. And the nature was calling to me. It was calling and calling to me. I thought, where I need to be is at the base of this tower, where I can touch the earth. Not earth that has been filled in inside a rock wall, but but real earth. What is this tower? Where's the foundation this tower is sitting in? And so I walked back through the parking lot, and there was a little trail at the base of the um, uh, Mary Magdalene Tower, and the little trail led off to some wildflowers, and there was a little area there, and I saw Sat and I thought, well, I'll just meditate. Maybe I'll get what I needed. And uh, it wasn't something I was doing, but it was something that I felt like I needed to surrender to. And so I sat there and I went into deep meditation. I sat down with my legs crossed because there wasn't anywhere else to put them. And I had noticed a butterfly or two, and that was kind of special. But I sat there in deep meditation among those purplish flowers and then I felt like there was a presence around me, and I looked, and there were hundreds of butterflies around me. I looked them up in the internet. They were Atalanta, A-T-A-L-A-N-T-A, as best I could see. I'm not a butterfly expert, but they looked very much like that. If anybody wants to go to the internet and look up those butterflies, that's exactly what they looked like to me later. But right then, uh, there were butterflies uh, touching my legs that had lit, lit on my pants legs and, and on my sleeves and shoulders, and and it was just the most mystical experience. It's like having a hundred little thousand, a hundred little fairies around you or something. It was just the most mystical experience. But a mystical experience, normally you you have it, it, it transcends ordinary. It is an experience. And normally you are changed. So how did I get changed by that? Well, you know, a butterfly... Uh, it starts life as a caterpillar, and you know the story. It, it wraps the cocoon around itself, you know, with the thread. It spins there. What I did not know until later was when the butterfly is in the cocoon, I, I mean, when the um, caterpillar is in the cocoon, I always thought it just sort of changed, grew wings and changed into the butterfly, just sort of like a tadpole changes into a frog. It starts growing legs and things like that. The tail disappears. Well, that's not what happens. The butterfly in the cocoon goes completely liquid. I mean, the caterpillar disappears into a liquid state and then the butterfly comes out of that liquid state and so there's a complete meltdown if you want to call it that of the caterpillar and then when the butterfly is inside that cocoon he has and is fully developed he has to get out and so when the butterfly gets out of the cocoon it has to struggle the struggle is what's important for the butterfly at that point because that's how he builds his muscles. If he does not struggle, if you open up the cocoon and say, here, little butterfly, come out and stretch your wings, he can't fly. He needs the struggle to be able to fly. And so all those butterflies around me, I realized they were little little pinpoints of God's light saying, the struggle is okay. Look, look what happens. Look what happens. You're learning your own butterfly self, if you want to put it that way. What a story. And and I can, I don't think, I was going to say I can only imagine how you felt after that happened, but I don't think I can imagine that. It was phenomenal. I didn't want to leave. Well, I had to leave. I couldn't stay there forever. But I didn't want to leave. I've never been in the presence of so many butterflies. I saw some when I sat down to meditate, but and I wanted to be around those purplish flowers. But I didn't think that there would be so many butterflies around. And it was quite a special experience. And so, yes, I have been to Rennes Le Chateau, but my experience was with the butterflies. Yes, uh, well, I think you uh, you you got the premier tour. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and another thing I, that you just sort of touched on there, I want to bring out. You have a very deep connection with nature, and it's as if your connection with this divine spark inside of you uh, is uh, intensified 
when you are alone with nature and you're really communing with nature. Um, say something about that. Okay, it is intensified. It's not already always been that way with me. Let me go back to childhood. When I was a child, you know, I told you I was a very intuitive child. And uh, I had an oak tree and I had pansy garden every every spring and summer. And that oak tree was just as alive to me as anybody would have imaginary friend. Oak tree had a spirit, a new... I didn't know to call it spirit, but there was a... Um, Oak tree was a friend to me, and it was just as real as a child would have an imaginary friend or something like that. Oak tree was very, very real to me. Uh, there was a trauma later in my life about oak tree. It was chopped in two, and so uh, that that was a trauma for me. And at that point, with that trauma, uh, I won't say I lost my connection to nature, but the horror of sitting there and watching that tree get chopped in half I could see the spirit of the tree leave I could hear it scream and um but I couldn't make a sound at the time I didn't know whether it was me screaming or the tree and I, uh, later I, I think it was the tree because I went silent but uh I had this so I had a connection to that when I was a child but we we grow up and the world teaches us in many ways that what we think is real is not real and we learn to play roles and we we learn uh not to trust our own own intuition and our own inner selves. And not all of us do, but some of us have had that t- those type of unfortunate experiences. And in my 20s, oh, I couldn't stand nature. I wouldn't go into nature. Looking back, maybe that was just my way of protecting myself. Mm-hmm. But uh, later on, uh, after I... Um, um, started having my spiritual awakening, nature got extremely important to me, to the point that I learned through nature. And I settled back. If it's a bad day, you'll find me walking through the woods. If I wake up with, with, with a sad thought or something, you'll find me walking through the garden. Um, if you want to call me a tree hugger, then go right ahead. I'm perfectly comfortable <laughs> perfectly comfortable with it now. <laughs> you know, I live in a subdivision that is has pin oaks all the way on either side of the street, all the way up and down, and they're the most wonderful pin oaks you have ever seen in your life. I say, <laughs> I've called them my support system because <laughs> Because they they uh, they they're alive with God's grace, you know it's 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 fantastic. Um, we are not on this planet alone. It's not just humans. Uh, it's it's all of us. You say nature is important to you, so you know what I'm talking about. Very. Nature, yeah, nature. It, it speaks to us. There's a, a lovely book out there called Nature Speaks, and it does speak. But you have to have the grace to listen. And listening is not something you do. Listening is something you allow. Yeah, yeah. Actually, and, and again, this is just my own personal bias over the the last 30 or 40 years that I've spent trying to uh, push away all the rubbish and try to focus on the real stuff, uh, you, you have to get out of your own way. Uh, you do. And you, you can't listen if you're talking <laughs> or you're generating information. You have to just sit there and be receptive. And um, uh, with me, it's, it's nature in general um, – I'm, you don't know this because you're not looking at, at the chat room, but I've mm-hmm. been putting some pictures up of actually one of them was a little girl hugging a huge tree, just as you were talking about it. Um, but I, I live uh, <laughs> in the northern Appalachian foothills now. Yeah. And I've always had a uh, deep love and uh, need for the peacefulness of being out in, in the woods and the trees and as, as much as I can into the mountains and animals. Animals are very special to me, just almost any animal in the world. Um, but it's, it's, I feel sorry for people who can't connect with, if not nature in general, at least something out there in nature that's not, not spawned by humans, because it seems to me it's the only way that we have to sort of clean ourselves out anymore, is through those exposures. 
Do you know the indigenous tribes were very, the ones I have studied, what few I have studied, were very connected to nature and, and nature taught them and they worked together with nature and nature supported them in their lives and they in turn respected nature. And at this point in time, we have gotten so business-minded, we have gotten so scientific that I think that we are taking from nature, but we are not letting nature support us. And I, a, lot of, a lot of things that I see do not seem to be supporting nature right back. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we've been, uh, as, as a species, we have become more and more... Um, let's just, I mean, it's way past not being stewards. It's its openly hostile at this point. It um, is openly hostile, and, and that's thats sad to me. It's very, very sad. It is. It is. Well, um, let me remind everybody, we've, we've got about 10 minutes before we're going to take a break here, Patty. We're talking with Patty Fivett, um, and we're talking about her most recent book, The Making of a Mystic, and it's about... If you read her book, first of all, the I would say about half of it, the middle part of it, are some of your insights, which some people refer to as poetry, but um, it's it's like those little telegrams from your soul that 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 just make your whole day peaceful when you read it. It's it's a wonderful book, but you also tell people how you actually began your own process. Um, and I'm wondering, you, you initially started out with these messages coming to you in writing, and then you went to a keyboard. Is yeah. that still the case? Do you have to do the writing, or, or have you developed some other ways of receiving these messages? Do you know, it's always come through writing, but I'm at the point now where, well, let me back up a little bit. When I first started this, and this goes back to another question, too, that you asked. It's like a PS to another question about that divine spark within. And uh, when I first started, it was like there was me and God, two separate things. But then as my own, uh, but I felt the love, I felt the connection. It was a very loving connection. But as my own, um, as I grew in wisdom, let's say, as as my own vibrational level increased, these questions and answers were, they were like spiritual psychology for me. It was the best psychology work I've ever had done and uh, probably will be. But uh, as my own uh, sense of self increased, as my own interconnection increased, as I became more aware of, of the connection to God, spirit and I, there wasn't such a fathom between us. It got closer and closer and closer and closer. And so now, uh, even occasionally while I'm talking now, it is coming through my voice and it's changing. There's never an end point with spiritual growth. And we don't know what direction it's going to go in. And But I really think there's never an end point. We get to a place where we're satisfied, but there's never an end point. If you really want to keep growing spiritually, you will keep growing spiritually spiritually and you will grow in ways that you don't even have an idea of how it's going to come so to answer your question i can still type i can still get there but i don't hear me as separate from that it's like i move into the word i'm looking for is oneness it's like there's a oneness that happens mm -hmm. that's a uh, that's just it's a special talent, but I, I, what I wanted to say first is that it's a special gift. I mean, that's just really wonderful. Um, and I, I want to encourage people that are listening, uh, feel free to put something in the chat room. We're going to open up the phone line after we come back after our break here in about five or six minutes. Um, I was mentioning the central portion of your book with these insights, and I think the one that I like the most uh, you have, I think it's on page 35, it, the title of it is Journey, and I really like the last sentence. It's very moving in that particular poem or insight. You say, our ultimate destiny in life is simply to acknowledge our individual empowerment by bonding to God's presence within. Isn't that beautiful? It just, it says so much. It's the kind of statement that you can kind of go back and read it again and again and chew on it a little bit. You keep getting a little bit more out of it as you go go you know, buy it. 
There are a lot of places in this book that I do exactly that, and that is one of this journey is one of the things that I uh, go back and read a lot. Um, if you don't mind, it's just four sentences, uh, five mm-hmm. sentences. Uh, mm-hmm. Let me read the whole thing. Okay. The, the most important journey we each t- we each must take in our lifetime is not contained within the everyday events of family or career. A most important journey is traveled inward, moving through our private pain into, through, into the true authenticity of our own nature. It is here we find our souls shining with divine light. It is here within that we realize the loving universal connection to ourselves. Our ultimate destiny in life is to simply acknowledge our individual empowerment by bonding to God's presence within. To me, that's it. Yeah. If anybody is ever out there listening has wondered why you were here, this is it. Well, and, and I have to say at the same time, I agree with you, that is it. That's it. I, it, I can't even say in a nutshell because it's not a nutshell. But at the same time, if you have successfully bought the lie uh, of society and you've never had this kind of an experience and you don't really know how to open up, I mean, look at how long it took you until you were able to do it. If you're one of those people who hasn't ever done this and hasn't ever heard that that voice inside, what you just read is just kind of baffling. It is. It is. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. It's, it's so simple, and yet if you've never been able to do it, it it might as well you might as well tell someone well you can just walk to Pluto all you got to do is start walking and <laughs> one day you'll wind up there. I think the trick not trick is the word that came to mind but but uh, I can't think of another word to use so I'll just use it. Uh, the trick is the thing is that it's not something you do. I can't say that enough. You don't do it. You allow it. It's just like you had said earlier. You step aside and you allow it to happen. Mm-hmm. And it, it and really, if you stop and think about it, that is such a simple thing to do. It's uh, simple, but we don't but want. We're to, conditioned not to do that at all. We are conditioned not to to do that. Uh, um, I started on this journey because every, I realized that everything I held dear at one time meant nothing to me anymore. It just meant nothing, and I was dying from the inside out. So the only thing that I really had is what I relied on. I had this belief that there's some sort of a force out there, if you want to call it God or spirit or the cosmic Christ or whatever you want to call it. Uh, by any other name, it's the same thing, actually. It's just different perceptions perspectives give us different names for it but uh, I felt like it was out there and uh, I wanted that to be prevalent in my life it was not a decision that I made lightly and it was not a decision that I thought about for a long time just one night in a thunderstorm there it is here I am changed my life and I don't know how to do it well, you're very lucky that it happened to you because it sounded from what you said earlier that you were right at the very last little knot in the rope before you let go. Do you know I really was at the very little, last little knot in the rope? I really, really was. Mm-hmm. I really, really was. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead just a little bit. We've only got about a minute, but I'm going to give a little bit of a teaser to the the second hour of the show here. I love that you started out one of your final chapters with a quote from Einstein. So many people, I have a very precocious nephew and mm-hmm. for several years he his well, I won't say who, but he he had been talked into becoming an atheist. Mm-hmm. And and talking to him over the last several years and he came around and he's blossomed and one of the things he said when he was still full blown into it was, well, none of the really brilliant scientists believe in God. And I said, well, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. And I found a book and bought him a copy and me a copy. And Mm -hmm. I was getting him to read it and we'd talk about it. But to a person, people like Einstein and some of the other really huge names throughout many centuries, it's not so much that they have a a belief in God or they were religious or they went to church or anything like that. But the more you know about the way the universe works 
And the more you know about nature and how it's not at all random, there's a beautiful, complicated order to it, you, you've got to say, you know, there's something here in the design that uh, is bigger than just randomness. So I want to read this quote from Einstein that uh, starts your chapter, one of your final chapters, and I want to read after that two more quotes that I found that go right with it. And then I think it'll be just about time for us to take a break. Um, but here's, here's uh, this is Einstein in his own words. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Uh, intuition is the father of new knowledge, while empiricism is nothing but an accumulation of old knowledge. Intuition, not intellect, is the open sesame of yourself. Indeed, it is not intellect, but intuition, which advances humanity. Intuition tells man his purpose in this life. Hmm. I love that. I love it, too. Um, we're going to take a break now, real quick. And uh, everybody stick with us. We'll be back in just a couple, say, three minutes or so. And we'll talk some more with Patty Fivett. Well, welcome back, everyone, to Epic Voyages Radio. We've been having a very uh, mystical, and I mean that as a pun and literally, and spiritual conversation here with Patty Fivett. Uh, who has written a book, The Making of a Mystic, and that's what we've been talking about tonight. Uh, of course, you're listening to Epic Voyages Radio on Inception Radio Network, and I'm your host tonight, Laurel Blythe Tag. Um, why don't you, uh, if you don't feel like coming into the chat room online or you can't get online, um, it, why don't you call our dial-in number, 888 919 Two three five five, and talk to Patty personally. Ask her a question about what we've been discussing. Uh, just at the end of the last uh, hour, I read these quotes from Einstein, and I had mentioned that so many people think that brilliant scientists know because they're so logical and they're so rational. They know that there's no such thing as divinity or God or a creator. That it's all just one great big wonderful random thing that's going on uh, and I I can't remember the name of this book but I'm sure if you google brilliant scientists atheism and spirituality you'd find the title many of these brilliant uh, scientists have a very deep-seated feeling that there is something very mystical very much uh, behind the scenes behind the curtain uh, responsible for the complicated order that they observe through their scientific uh, method. So, Patty, we, we had to cut right as I read those quotes. What do you have to say about that? I absolutely love those quotes. Um, I have been one most of my life that is just not scientific. I don't do science. I barely got through it going through school. It's it's not the way I function in the world, and I did the best I could. If I could memorize it, then I could get by and make a halfway decent grade. But it, was, it wasn't something I understood. But when I saw that Einstein quote, the intuitive mind is a sacred gift and the rational mind is a faithful servant, we've created a society that honors a servant and has forgotten the gift, I felt like I came home with the scientific community. I really, really did. In fact, I had that on my kitchen wall for a long time, but when I moved, it got lost in the move. I'd like to get the quote again and hang it on the wall again because it's so important. I was listening to I was listening to a scientist not too long ago uh, give a talk and and he had not, not for that to talk about things that I don't know the terminology for, and I apologize to the scientific community out there that are listening, but just bear with me. You'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, he was talking about the minute, teeny, tiny little particles that they have just discovered. I think they may be called quarks or something like mm -hmm. that. Quarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. That, and uh, he was talking about the ones that are not visible until somebody is seeing them. Mm -hmm. And... To me, that is just fascinating. How can you hear that and not know that there's or not feel that there's some sort of life force that's connecting all of us out there? If you want to call it God or spirit or whatever you want to call it, uh, how could you know that and and not uh, understand that that 
that that's how it is. It doesn't exist, so to speak, until it is being watched. How does it know? Well, that's that's this cosmic Christ thing. That's that's this life force that that I'm talking about. This is what the mystics have known forever. It's they they don't uh, necessarily just use their rational mind. They experience these things deeply and profoundly, and and a mystic experiences divinity and is forever changed by it. So. So uh, I think these things are really important to know, and it's it all ties together. And the more that we realize it all ties together, the better society as a whole on this planet is going to be. Yeah, my opinion. Right, right. Not just society, but the whole planet. Everything. Uh, yeah, the whole planet. Yeah, yeah. Um, you you're touching on uh, mysticism now and mystics, and that's where I was going to go next. I want to. Here's another wonderful quote that you had in your book, and this was starting your very last chapter about the process. Um, and this is a quote from Richard Rohr. A mystic yeah. doesn't say I believe; they say I know. A true mystic will ironically speak with that self confidence, but at the same time with a kind of humility. Isn't that wonderful? I read a lot of things that Richard Rohr has written. Uh, he's the first person that has ever tied together the mystical part of life and uh, any form of Christianity. Richard Rohr is actually Father Richard Rohr, and he's a Franciscan what I guess priest is the right, father is the right word. Uh, and he has studied uh, under, you know, the under the people who know about St. Francis of Assisi and actually call St. Francis his father. But wow. his, his writing brings Christianity and mysticism together in, in one vein. And I love that particular quote. He writes about mystics a lot. And, and he writes about the mystics of old and he writes about the mystics currently you know, in, in today's society. And and he says mystical experience is, I mean, a mystic is about experience. It's not what they read or they've told. It's about what they have experienced. And I, my own self, I agree with that totally. But what I do feel like is that none of us are going to experience anything like in mystically the same way because we're all different. We have different gifts. We have different uh, attitudes. We have different desires. We have different goals. We have different experiences. And we're made different. And I think even though there's a oneness that connects us all, we're individual parts of this oneness uh, sort of like Rumi had said, a, a drops in the sea of God, you know, the ocean, is, if the ocean is God, then it's made up of a lot of drops. And so that's how we are. So uh, I think the mystics um, uh, of today, it, it's more about experience. Well, uh, it definitely. And if, if you use the word experience to mean something that you sense from outside of your own creating it, Definitely, definitely. And yes. I, I want to ask you, your mm -hmm. title is about modern mystics. Modern. Now, what, what's the difference between a mystic and a modern mystic? Why do you make that distinction? You know, I made that distinction because when I first started talking about mystics and mysticism, people automatically thought I was talking about the people in the 1200s and 1500s that that were known as the mystics of today and were made into the saints and, uh, you know, had, had reached sainthood uh, of status that was conferred upon them. And, and those people, they left beautiful writings. Uh, I think interior castles of St. Teresa of Avila and, and many, m many more. St. John of the Cross left, left some writings. You know, he's the one that coined the dark night of the soul. And, and many of them have made writings. Uh, Julian of Norwich, I think, is, is one of them. But anyway, but what you get with, with those people is a sense of... <laughs> Eric, Eric has okay, a question for I, I, you, Patty. I'm here. Yes, I do. <laughs> Actually, I, I have a, a show on the I, I have a show on the, uh, the same network called Psychology's Outer Limits. Oh, and, uh, what anyway, a delightful there is title! A, there is that calling. I'm sorry. What a delightful title! It is neat. Well, I'm not entirely into the paranormal, but I kind of like where the edges meet. But yeah, you were talking about a young man who said that there, there certainly there can't be a 
divine being because really, in, really brilliant people don't believe uh, because they know better. But, you know, I, I've, I've been in the psychology field for 40 years, and I've, I've had a chance to talk to a lot of neurosurgeons in particular. And these are, you know, these are very brilliant people. Yes. And, and I think if you'd have a hard time finding a neurosurgeon that didn't believe in God because of the work that they do. They just find it impossible to believe that this was all by accident. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I wanted to offer that comment that, you know, the world is... It's full of brilliant people. Uh, it's, you know, in, in a way, you know, since we don't have scientific evidence of a God and we're never going to, it's a choice. It's a, it's a preference. But, I, you know, I think it's something that should be well thought out. And and leaving it up to other people is is not a good way to make a decision. So I wanted to pass those comments along to the young man if it helps him. I appreciate those comments. I think that's a very important point. A lot of times, I think, I know I have this in my own uh, extended family, uh, somebody that says they don't don't believe in God. And, and when I questioned him, I uh, don't believe in any kind of thing like that. When I questioned him, he began to talk about the church, which is different you know the church is an organization and and he was talking about the organization and i i I literally said to him i said now are you speaking of the organization or are you speaking of of a divine presence or something of that sort and and he he had never even separated the two so well um, and you and you make an excellent point because churches are they're 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 man-made uh, organizations. God didn't make churches, um, just as the Bible was written by people. Uh, and, you know, really, and sometimes it seems like a weak argument, but all we have to fall back on are our experiences and, and our faith. But I think I'm a reasonably bright person, and I believe in God. Wonderful. I think that probably that'll help to hear other people. Um, uh, I mean, to hear people say that. Uh, I think this is this is a wonderful thing. I'm, with my own experiences, there's there's no way I couldn't. There's just no way I could not. But uh, because I have had my experiences with God, and and I remember uh, being six years old, and in a very fundamentalist church that my parents and grandparents went to for, for generations, actually. And there I was, and it's be six, and I was a very impressionable child and extremely sensitive. And the teacher showed us a picture of people burning that fire was eating their flesh. And it had made such an impression to me that I can still remember it. I could probably draw it if I had that talent. But, uh, and she said, this is what happens to little boys and girls who don't do what God wants them to. They will burn in hell. And I looked at her. Oh, my gosh. I know. I looked at her and I said, then I'd prefer to believe in Santa Claus because at least he loves you and gives you toys once a year. (laughs) Uh, Good for you. I, I was I was simply saying that that you know so, uh, some folks that are deeply involved in religion uh, seem more interested in frightening people than in than in helping them. And uh, you know, so a, a church can really put a person off, and then another church can make a person feel good about their belief. But you know, what the most important thing is is, and I talk about this, and when I teach. It's critical thinking. You know, examine the facts, examine how you feel, and then you decide what you think. But, you know, when I hear someone say, well, I don't believe in something because these people don't, then you're letting other people do, you know, your, uh, your thinking for you. And you should, you know, everyone should do their own thinking and come to their own conclusions. So tell him to, you know, spend time thinking about it and then decide what he thinks. And if he still concludes he doesn't believe in God, well, that's okay, too. It is. But at least he'll own the decision. Eric, while well, we've got you here on, on the line with us, and Patty, I'd like to put a question to both of you, mm-hmm. if, if you don't mind answering it. Um, Eric, I'll start with you first. Do you, from your perspective, do you feel like intuition and ration or logic are equal in the sense that 
Uh, you have to have both of them. They both have a have a significant contribution and significant information that the other can't provide. Or do you see one as uh, a heavier weight than the other one? Well, I see I see them as a uh, as an intertwined system. Uh, you know, when people think, <clears throat> their intuition often leads them down a, a path that that then combines with logic to help them solve a problem. Um, so, from one point of view, I would give them equal weight. But I often tell my students and my clients when I was doing therapy that if you really thought something through, you know, go with your gut which in this case would be uh, intuition. So probably I would give to intuition maybe a little more weight uh, as a standalone concept. That's very interesting. Thank you for being candid about that. I, I'm, I really appreciate your answer. Patty, how would, I think I know what you're going to say, but what, <laughs> what's your answer? I would agree with Eric. I think they, um, uh, they intertwine. While you were asking the question, I got this, this vision of a Celtic knot. You know, it, it has no beginning and it has no end. It, it intertwines uh, uh, around itself. And um, I, I think intuition and logic intertwine around itself and I think you have to have one and the other one I don't think it works well not for me anyway if I don't have the logic or the intuition sometimes I need the logic to help me interpret what the intuition is telling me and sometimes I need the intuition well, that makes sense. yeah and sometimes I need the intuition to help me make logical decisions how do I really feel about that well that's a gut reaction that's, that's and the gut reaction is a term that anybody understands you know so so what is my gut telling me sure. uh, this is the facts that I know but but are, are there more facts out there is my gut telling me this is going to be the right thing for me so I use both of them enter you know uh, interchange Changeably, but together, and I think they're all tied well, together. Is often a, intuition is often a powerful input uh, for logic. I mean, we need logic to make good, uh, you know, to make good decisions. But you know, when I watch people think sometimes, or when people have the aha experience, which we call insight learning, yeah. you know, my belief is that the, is that the, there there was there was an intuition that, that, that got the machinery going. And then the mm -hmm. logic kicked in to clean it up, make sense out of it, and, and, and then that provides the output or, you know, whatever your perception is. Yes. Yeah. I always, um, I too, Eric, am a psychologist and have taught at the college level, and I used to tell my students that um, intu intuition and logic are like a black horse and a white horse leading a chariot. And you've got to have both of them. They need to be pulling in tandem. You can't let one of them pull too hard yes. one way or the other because the chariot is going to turn over, and then you're going to be in a mess. Oh, I agree. If you, if, if you overly rely on one or the other, I don't think that a person would do as well as they would if they would simply allow them to work together. Right. But intuition is very powerful. It's very it's, – it's really not something we can study in the lab, but like, you know – which we can't study paranormal in the lab, but where a lot of psychologists would argue against the paranormal, I don't think I know any that would that would argue against people having a sense of intuition. Yeah, uh, give a give a plug for your show again. Oh sure, it's on uh, Sunday nights at seven o'clock Eastern time. It's mm -hmm. called the Outer Limits of Psychology. We we discuss news from psychology, usually sort of the bleeding edge kind of stuff. And then we cover a little bit of paranormal. And then, you know, once in a while I have a guest try to inject a lot of humor. And the chat room is usually very busy. Uh, that's fun. And uh, it's a good show. And Instruction Radio Network has been, I've only done seven shows. They have been incredible mm -hmm. in terms of support. And I, and. And in turn, I like to listen to the shows. So I especially like them when they're live. I just, well, I just put their, uh, I just put it, put it on and heard your show. So I thought I would call in because the, what the little boy said just struck me as, oh my gosh, that's just the wrong road to go down. Right. Well, I, I appreciate your, your empathy towards him, and he, he has come around and is no longer there where this uh, relative of his led him. Uh, believe it or not, it was a relative. Sure. Yeah. And uh, 
I, I will look for your show. It sounds really interesting. It uh, does. It really does. Thank you and for I'm sharing so, that. I'm well, so glad that, that you stuck with us and kept calling until, until you got through. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I got through, too. And I'll let you folks get on with your show. Okay. Thanks, Eric. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> That's wonderful. Care, so, bye. So Eric made a, a couple of really good points there, Patty. He did. He really did. Um, yeah. Let me give out that uh, telephone number again in case somebody, some little fish out there in the stream wants to nibble at it. It's 888-919-2355. Talk to Patty Fivett here about her book, The Making of a Mystic. Um, while we go back, you, the, you, the two of you were talking about something, and I've got to ask this question because I was brought up. Uh, in a very fundamental, I'm from Texas, and probably everyone could guess what that fundamental religion is I was brought up in. Um, you grew up in Georgia, and you're now yeah. living in North Carolina, which is my old haunts. Um, yeah, yeah. Traditional fundamental religion, I imagine, is still the dominant avenue in that part of the world for connecting to God in any way that, that you'd care to talk to your neighbors, you know, and associates about. So your position and your practice, how are they received? What's the reaction to you and your position and practice by what I would call your peers or colleagues who seek a connection with God? The first time I went to speak to a group, there were about 30 in the group, and it was in one of the local churches, and I was asked as a, a, just a guest to come in and, and speak to this, this group on, on a Sunday morning. And when I finished, I was aware that they were looking at me like I was from outer space. <laughs> And that's putting it nicely. <laughs> Actually, it is. <laughs> Actually, it is. They were really wishing that you would go to outer space right then, probably. Uh, or, or leave their room. Yeah. <laughs> leave their room uh, and it wasn't that I was saying anything that I felt like was particularly weird or way out there I was using what what put them off was different terminology for the same thing oh yeah they were used to hearing uh, certain words to describe things and and here I was describing it a little different um um uh, for instance, I said uh, Christ was not Jesus' last name. Oh, that didn't go off really well <laughs> at first. <laughs> you know? You're a brave girl. <laughs> yeah, but it, it was an interesting experience. I like to have experiences that are interesting, you know, and so so I have learned to taper it a little bit. But to tell you the truth, um, uh, I have gotten more attention through the uh, Internet radios than I have l locally. Okay, and you think that's yeah. because of the geography and, and the preponderance? I, I, of... I do, actually, yes. Yes, I do. Uh, um, this are there any Unitarian or Unity churches around where you are? Yeah, there's one that's, that's not, not terribly far. It's in a different town, but it's about okay. 30, 40 miles away. Yeah. So they're nowhere yeah. near as prevalent as Baptists or Methodists? Oh, my goodness, no. Okay. Okay. No, no, you've got not only the Baptists and the Methodists, but you have have some of the older um, uh, Moravians and, and um, you know, and, and um, Quaker. Probably some Mennonites, too. Yeah, yeah, so you've, you've got that a lot, and it would be, no, I would enjoy sitting down and listening to people talk about about their different different organizations and, and what, the, what they believe in, but which brings me to another thought about uh, religious organizations, whatever kind they are. Um, don't misunderstand me. For the audience, I am not against them, but I have learned over the years that when an organization, now I'm talking about any organization, whether it's an educational organization, Organization, mm -hmm. organization, whether a it's a, a district, religious or school, office, or whatever, anybody, yeah, right. a post office, whether it's a garden club, mm -hmm. um, a bridge club, you know, whatever. An organization seems to be formed at first, and people have this purpose, and the organization has a purpose, and they go out and they do the best they can with their activities to facilitate this purpose because that's why the organization was formed. But eventually, there's some changes that are made within the 
the organization. And it seems to me like after a period of time, and that period of time is different length of time per organization, but after a period of time, it seems like the organization's purpose fades somewhat and the purpose becomes to perpetuate the organization. Exactly. I agree with you 500%. That's exactly what I have thought too. It becomes and, about making that business or organization continue and it, yeah. and very often it's about bringing in a revenue stream so they can continue because now they yes. they pay people on, on uh, yes. payroll. Yeah, and I have visited churches around here. I have only lived here like four and a half years. My husband has been here longer. And uh, I have noticed just from an outsider in some churches I have visited, I really am an outsider. You know, I've, I, they don't even know me. They don't know I've written a book that I tend to, to like mystical Christianity, and, and they don't know anything about me, but they have their, their cliques and their, their ways, and uh, uh, yes, come, but we're going to do it this way, and, and, and um, thank you for visiting, and we've known each other for 50 years, you know. And so, to me, that is an organization that is perpetuating the organization. Well, at the same time, um, especially in in the rural areas of the country, I think a church is more than just something that has to do with with God or spirituality. It's also a social uh, center. It's the heart of a community, too. It and is. Sometimes there's it more is. than one heart. But yeah. those people and their families and their grandparents and great grand everything and the babies were christened there and people were married there and it's got such a history that's almost part of a personal family's history and um i think in the same way that if you were sitting there with your 15 or 20 relatives having christmas or thanksgiving dinner and the doorbell rang and four people you'd never seen before in your entire life said hi is is it time for dinner <laughs> you would go uh what who are you it's very much like that. Yeah, and yeah. we've all done that. We've all been the ones at dinner uh, maintaining our status quo. We've done this the way we've always done this, and somebody new comes in and, and says, N now, why are we still doing this? Uh, may I join? And a new face or a new activity or something comes in, and oh, we have to ask ourselves, are we challenged about this? Are we excited about this this new opportunity? Uh, it's, we, we've all been there with different things. People I don't, don't like the status quo change normally, and not if they're happy with it. I don't remember the exact quote, but I remember that Paul Tillich said it, and it was in a book, and I yeah. read it somewhere back in the late 60s, and this was, this was when I knew that the Baptist church was not for very much longer going to tolerate me within its halls. <laughs> uh, they had asked, it was, we were at the age where you were supposed to do a Sunday school lesson. Just one, just one Sunday school lesson uh, before you went into the adult classes. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I thought, well, this book is fascinating. And the quote that I, I thought was so important was basically a faith that you cannot question. A faith on question is not faith. It, if you can't evaluate it, if you can't question it and reaffirm your belief... It's not really faith. It's, it's, you can call it anything you want to, but it's not faith. Faith, faith by definition, needs a periodic reevaluation and reaffirmation. So if you're, if you're going through the, the motions and saying, I have faith in this, I believe this, but you've never questioned it and you've never reaffirmed it and really gone mm -hmm. through sort of a, gee, maybe, uh, maybe I should think more about this. Mm -hmm. It's not faith. And that's Paul Tillich. That's not me. That's Paul Tillich. And it just really got me in trouble with, with the Sunday school teacher to the point that she went all the way to my mother and told her. <laughs> and my mother, the only thing she could say is, well, at least she's honest. <laughs> well, good, good for your mother. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't mean that as a compliment. <laughs> but uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes getting bogged down by the way we've always done it and the way that we think people have always done it and should do it gets in the way, again, my my favorite saying here getting out of your own way it gets in the way of hearing things which are special that 
maybe were there all the time, but you can't hear them if you've got your little fingers in your ears. That's right. And if we don't question, that, that's what makes faith deeper. Uh, I, I think often we are taught not to question, that we are, or get this idea that if we question, we're going to be different, that we're going to be ostracized, or, or uh, we're going to um, be kicked out of the group, or not understood, or not loved, or, or uh, we feel guilty for having questioned. We don't want to question authority figures. Now, I'm not talking about being rude questioning. I'm just talking about asking, well, what does that mean? Give me a, mm-hmm. a, a uh, is there a deeper meaning? Uh, you know, can you take this and apply it to another situation? Can you look at it from a different angle? I think questioning is how we grow. Who was the writer that, was it Rilke that said, live the questions in life? I think that's wonderful. Live the questions. Yes. Yeah. Well, some of the answers are pretty amazing. Uh, some of the answers are quite, pretty amazing. Often, if I have a question about something, you know, like I'm trying to make a decision or and I can't get the rational mind and the, and the intuition to agree on anything and I'm a little confused, I will go to the divine and before I go to sleep and I will say, give me a dream. Give me a dream. And do you know, usually it happens. Of course, in my case, I'd have to remember it when I, when I woke up. <laughs> Which is my another case, problem. <laughs> in my case, I have trouble forgetting it. <laughs> the very, um, very <laughs> here's here's a good question. Let me remind everybody we've we've got about twenty minutes left, and I want people to uh, come into the chat room and type in questions if you like, or call on our toll free number eight 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 nine one nine two three five five, and ask Patty F- uh, Five It. I almost said it wrong again. Patty Five It. Uh, questions about her book, The Making of a Mystic. And real quick, I want to remind everybody that there is a promotion going on right now uh, for Epic Voyagers on Instagram. And everyone that follows us at Epic Voyagers and tags three friends will be entered into a lottery to win one free autographed copy of Ken Cherry, our president uh, and founder of Epic Voyagers, his new book, Mark Slade Investigates, the Stephenville UFO. So follow us and tag three friends on Instagram and get into the um, uh, drawing there. Um, we were talking about getting these insights. Now, here's a, here's a question. In your chapter entitled Recognition, you do talk a little bit about and you mentioned it earlier tonight that you were really kind of taken aback at receiving what seemed to be eventually really truly mystical insights. Just yourself, the old Patty, you know, who am I to receive mystical insights? Yeah. How does a person verify that those kinds of insights are mystical insights and they're not just some sort of, you know, hallucination or whatever? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, I would say by the content of the insight, is it uh, helping you to get closer to who you really are? Is it getting your life into a better better place? Is it giving you wholesome advice? Um, uh, is it confusing you? Um for me, I, I go through life in the feeling stage. Uh, there, there are people who are visually oriented and people who are uh, oriented through the hearing stage. And, and of course, if I were hearing aid, you know that's not me. And uh, But I, I go through the feeling stage. Even when I take a test on in school, I would say, oh, there's four answers, but number two feels right to me. So uh, for me, I can only answer this question. For me, it's how does it feel? feel? Does it feel peaceful and does it feel loving, these insights? Does it feel spiritually? How is my body telling me uh, about this? And um, so that's how I can tell is is it uh, causing, if it's causing turmoil, if it's causing uh, something that feels dysfunctional or that just feels like I've been hit in the stomach, then I know it's not real. And I will say before I open up to anything insightful, I will set an intention and I will say a prayer that uh, whatever comes be 
of a higher vibration from a higher place, from a higher self. And I will ask for protection. I think this is really important as we all have our intuition grow i have had people tell me they have asked for intuition and it has really soared uh but they are so confused about what really is true and what really is not and i would say to the listeners uh, as answer to your question always ask for discernment oh it'll be there it'll happen but always ask for the gift of discernment very good advice. Very, yeah. very good advice. It's really important, actually. Um, you you make another really good point in that chapter called recognition um, that mysticism is not anything occult. It is not magic. It is not anything whatsoever that an individual causes to happen to manipulate some aspect of reality. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, let me preface this first by saying this chapter in the in the Christian terminology was divinely inspired. I really was not sure what I had written until I finished writing it. And when I went back and read it, I was in that state of oneness when I when I wrote it. So so this came through me and not from me, and that's really important. But but uh, I don't think mysticism has anything to do with of my teaching. Is it? I don't think mysticism has anything to do with self-seeking. It's an entirely spiritual uh, activity. It has nothing to do with making our ego grand and glorious. It has nothing to do with with uh, saying, oh, I got this insight and I'm going to go tell you how to live your life. Let me uh, say this to the listeners. If somebody says to you, oh, I received intuition and it says that you should do this, this, and this, please don't listen unless you ask them. I have had people come up to me at different conferences and say, oh, your solar plexus is spinning in the wrong direction and I have, <laughs> and I can get it straightened out. And I said, please leave my solar plexus alone. We're happy. <laughs> you know, life is working well. <laughs> That's <laughs> hilarious. It really was. <laughs> you know, my, my friend Maria was with me and she says, did I hear that right? <laughs> I said, I think so. <laughs> You know, but people, when their intuition is first, uh, first blooming, they think, "Oh, this is wonderful! It's a gift from God." And and I think it's a, it's our way of connecting with God, is our way of of communicating. But that doesn't mean you need to go knock on people's door and say, um, "I really feel like you should do this." I had a vision, blah 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 blah. And maybe your vision is correct, but unless that person asks you, then. I would keep it to myself. Yeah, there, um, and we talked about this earlier. Uh, there's an awful lot about, I guess I would call it mysticism, intuition, basically just listening, just mm-hmm. being quiet and listening. There's an awful lot about that that has to do with humility. And if, oh, if yeah. you're listening for answers, I don't know how you could become confused and feel like you need to be telling everybody else what the answer was you just got. That's not being uh, that's not being filled with humility. It's not being filled with grace, and it's certainly not having healthy boundaries, and it's not being respectful of the other person. Uh, when I write these things, I always say at the first of the book or the first of the chapter or somewhere in the book, this is how I understand it. Please listen with your heart and take whatever you feel may be important to your life and uh, integrate it in for your life, your way, and know that, that what I say is not me telling you anything. Um, Neutron in our in our chat room just put up a a, a brilliant little statement here. I'm going to read it to you. I think you'll okay. really enjoy this. An occultist wants to learn life in order to extend his life or control their own reincarnation. A mystic learns life in order to live once and do what it takes to progress to the next level. Oh, that's beautiful. It is. Neutron, yeah. you should be writing this stuff down. Whoever wrote that, congratulations. That's wonderful. Thank <laughs> you for writing people. it. Thank you for sharing. That's that's wonderful. 
Um, this brings up a, a question I was going to ask earlier. I didn't mm-hmm. get to it. You started out uh, your your process. Would you call it? It's not really meditation. What would you? And it's not channeling at all, right? No, it's not channeling. Channeling, as I understand it, means that you have a being on the other side, a form of some sort or personality on the other side, giving you information and in some way, and you you're writing it down or learning from that. And I don't feel like that's what what I have experienced at all. Okay. So, so your process, how is it that you start when you sit down to do this? I set an intention. Okay. Let my small self, self get out of the way. I invoke my, 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 my higher self. I have, and that's the only intention I have. I don't have any personal intention unless there is an area of my life that I want to know about or something in which case I will I will say to today I really need uh, request information about this or that uh, you know something specific and that's how I started anyway but I always acknowledge the presence of the divine I always connect to the presence of the divine I always state uh, what I want uh, which usually not specifically, generally, which usually comes as, bless me indeed, I say that a lot, I ask that only uh, that which is the highest and the best answer will come through and let it be strong enough to filter through my mind that uh, will often go off on tangents and pick the wrong thing. So let it be strong enough, a connection, so that I am able to feel it is strong enough. And I always ask for the gift of discernment. After it comes, and sometimes it won't readily come. Sometimes it comes the next day. Sometimes I am expecting to be, and that will stop the flow. You have to be open enough to uh, realize that that the answer to your question may be far beyond what you even imagine it could could be. So you have to be open, and in the process, you do open up to it. And when the answer comes, it may come for me with through writing, but it also may come through a dream. It may come through something three or four people have said that is similar. You know, it may come through through all of a sudden I'm seeing in a magazine of several different magazine articles the same thing mentioned or the same thing mentioned you know it's it's it'll it'll always come just know it'll come it'll always come but with the gift of discernment you will know when it comes ah there it is there it is and you know you know with every fiber of your being that this is right because you can feel it in your body i had somebody ask me not too long ago where do you feel it in your body sometimes i feel it below my heart in my um, but between my my solar plexus and my heart chakra, somewhere in there, and sometimes I feel it in my body, but actually it's like a light right above my head. Sometimes I feel both of that. Now this is when I know I'm 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 getting what's real, and and what is holy and what is divine and proper for me at the moment. And sometimes I will feel it uh, like a sense of effervescence that is all over my body, but that is specific to me and uh, I, I say to the listeners um, don't expect exactly that it may happen that way with you but it may happen in a different way and your job is to learn how it happens for you Here, here's a question uh, again from Neutron in the chat room that's right on top of what you were just talking about do you get a certain physical trigger or sensation prior to getting an intuition well, I, I sort of, oh, prior to, now what I was talking about was during the intuition. Sometimes I will, sometimes I will, sometimes it will feel, how do I describe it? Uh, like there's going to be an aha moment. Like a rush of excitement, and that's what I will feel, like there's going to be an aha moment. Kind of like your whole body going, shh, listen. Yes. Or like my whole body saying, goody, 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 here it is. <laughs> Especially with the effervescence. Um, yeah. <laughs> so one of the things you're saying, if uh, I'm going to say this in totally different words, yeah. for everybody, 
part of what you need to do as you work yourself through this process and develop your own process with it, you have to learn to notice those little feelings that you're getting, those inklings that tell you, yep, I'm on the right track versus, oh, this feels icky and I don't know why, but I need to back off because you will be able to tell. And the more you trust it, the more deliberate those feelings are. Isn't that right? That's exactly right. I think it's, um, oh, I'll think of her name in just a minute. But one of the, Martha Beck, Martha Beck calls it shackles on or shackles off. Mm. And when, when you get this feeling, uh, do you feel like you have been shackled? Are you trying to decide, for instance, the other day I thought, you know, I think I'll go back to school and study a particular subject. And and so I started looking and on the internet, so I looked for schools that had this particular subject in mind. And the more I looked, the sicker I felt like I was. And before long, I felt like I had weights on my body. Okay, that shackles on. That's my body and my soul speaking through my body saying, uh uh-uh, honey, you don't really want to do this. Why did you think you wanted to do this? Look look at your reason. You know, you're trying to, to gratify yourself in some way, and it, you really don't need this, you know. And so I think the shackles on or shackles off is a good way to get started, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, so here's a question for you, Patty. Okay. So going back to where we started with this, and you were telling about that horrible period in your life where you were... Yeah so completely divorced from everything that was true about yourself. Mm -hmm. Did you at that point know that there was a part inside of you that, that could tell you when it feels right or it didn't feel right? Or were you so separated from yourself, you didn't even have that sensation that, oh, this feels right or this doesn't feel right? That's a good question. I was so separated from myself, I had no idea what felt right or what didn't feel right. In fact, um, I wasn't even thinking about me with what felt right or not felt right. I was thinking, now, is this going to feel right to my husband or is this going to feel right to one of my parents? That's is this what I'm expected to do, in other words? Yeah, is this what I'm expected to do? And that's where I was. I had no idea on this earth what felt right to me. I was completely separated from that. So there's a there's a step here that we really haven't covered, and I don't even know that we could cover it, plus we've only got about three minutes, but there's a step where actually it's a, it's a chasm that has to be leapt over where on one side you're just so totally out of touch with yourself and your own organic nature, and on the other side you're starting to understand that there is a built-in uh, spiritual gyroscope that if you would just listen to it and pay attention, you can trust it, and it will always lead you where you need to be. There's something in between the two of those. And from Patty, from your description, you were very, I was going to say lucky, but you were blessed to have the experience of something cutting through all of that muck of your own design and and getting your attention to help you realize that. I'm wondering if maybe it almost has to be something from outside reaching in and grabbing you in that solar plexus and saying, hey, wake up. For me, it had to be something outside reaching in. But I think the answer to the question for me, what is that that thing in between those two Mm -hmm. states that you were speaking of? Mm -hmm. For me, that was uh, a knowledge that I never, never gave up, that there is a divinity out there. I never gave that up. And for me, it was that divinity. And uh, so the acknowledgement of that divinity, but uh, it came into my life through my pen and pencil and made itself very, very real and not something that was just foreign and out there somewhere. So, uh, but I think for me that, that, to say it again in a different way, uh, it was the knowledge that there is a divinity out there somewhere and, and hopefully I was connected to it. That's as close as I got. But that was why I got from point A to point B. Well, then I would say that you're, it's very good that you still had that faith in divinity, even though you didn't have any sense of faith in yourself. 
So yeah. if, if you maybe didn't have even that, it could be pretty difficult to get started. I had, I had the divinity. All my ideas about it were, were more of about sin and punishment, and like I had been taught in in, in church and in that particular church, and so. Uh, that that was my thought about it, but I still acknowledge that it was there. But I opened up to it in a new way. Mm-hmm. I surrendered to it, and that's that being receptive again. Yeah, it when, is. When you're being receptive, it's it's a it's a vulnerability. It's making yourself vulnerable, and I think that's another thing that might prevent some people from uh, wholeheartedly giving themselves over to that. And I had trouble with the surrender part for years. Uh, to re- surrender to me meant, and, and this is back in the psychological a- aspect, but surrender to me meant put myself aside and do what something somebody else wanted to. And that's really not what I'm talking about when I surrender to the divine. That's not what I'm talking about at all. You're, when you surrender to the divine, you're very much there in your, your own self and your own love, but you open up and say, uh, is there something more? I'm ready to receive it, and I trust it, I'm open to it, and I'm willing for this to happen. Okay. Patty, we've got not even, we've got not even two minutes (laughs) left, (laughs) and I need to ask you, I've been pasting your website, pattyfivet.com, in the chat room, P-A-D-D-I-E-F-I-E-V-E-T. Uh, it's P-A-D-D, it's P-A-D-D-Y. I'm like sorry, a did I not say that? Yes, yeah, P-A-D-D-Y. Sorry, okay. F-I-E-V-E-T. And do you have any speaking engagements or conferences or anything coming up? I don't have any speaking engagement in conferences, and right now I'm not taking new clients. Uh, I'm working very hard on a third book, and this book is about mysticism, and I'm learning as I go along. It's inspired. Parts of it are inspired, and I'm going uh, learning as I go along, and I'm also working on, on uh, audio recordings, and that's fun, and they're about mysticism, too. Okay, wonderful. And, th- and you'll be able to see those on my website. I've got a lot of information on my website, and there's more to come. So I ask that you check my website. Do you have a blog there, too? Or I do, yes. Okay, do. so that would be another good reason to go there. Yeah, yeah. And within two months, I should have the audio recordings there. Okay. Well, it's been a uh, very exciting conversation for me, Patty, and I I thank you so much for coming on uh, Epic Voyages Radio with us and talking to us, and uh, I'll definitely keep in touch with you about this next book, and maybe you'll come back and talk with us some more. Oh, I'd like that. That was fun. I have enjoyed this. It's nice talking to someone who understands mysticism and and is very connected to nature. I think this has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. It's it's been like a nice warm shower for me. <laughs> it has. I feel like I've had tea with an old friend. <laughs> this has been fun. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, we're getting ready to wrap up now. And uh, next week, I'll be interviewing Dane Wigington here about uh, geoengineering and weather control. So don't forget to come back next week at 9 p.m. And also, this show will be rebroadcast this coming Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern on Dark Matter Radio Network. So thanks again to Patty for the wonderful conversation. Thanks to our wonderful people in chat for their excellent questions. And thanks very much to Joe Champion, our producer, for his very, very hard work. Good night, everybody, and have a wonderful week. Thank you for being with us tonight. Please join us again next Monday evening for Extraordinary Phenomena Investigations Council's Epic Voyages. I'm Roger Peacock for Epic. Until next time. You say.